Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, no. hold on. Set a timer for 30 minutes. Didn't work. Set a... It really didn't work. Set it. Okay, well, it worked now. Here's the thing. When I did this four years ago, I had to set a timer with this, a phone, and I had to touch it with my fingers. I got to the airport, and then I got to my motel in a taxi cab four years ago. Now, I can talk to my wrist, and I can summon up an Uber from 30,000 feet in the plane. It's miraculous. And who knows, four years from now, should I do this again? If the pace of technological advance continues, in four years, it's entirely possible my motel Wi-Fi will work. <laughs> I'm trying to send my speech notes, what there are of notes here, to my uh, pad. And I'm trying to send it via Gmail. Type it away. Looks like I got a connection. And then Safari could not contact Google.com because it couldn't find the server. Couldn't find Google. I'm in Mountain View. I should be able to pick it up on my dental fillings. Hey, Google, find a restaurant. Okay, there's one two blocks away. So it's amazing what changes in four years, isn't it? When I came here first time for Erica, and Erica, wherever you are, thank you so much for both of these visits. Um, I got some questions saying, you know, how do you feel about this Trump guy? And I was like, I don't really know. And I'm not saying things change. <laughs> but I'm saying some things could change. So, Erica gives me a call last March, was it? I think it was. Yeah. And asked me if I want to come to San Francisco again. Of course I do. But again, you know, four years, things change. Four years ago, five years ago, if I'd said to my friends in Minnesota, I'm going to San Francisco, they would have said, ooh. Now, when I say I'm going to San Francisco, they say, ooh. <laughs> because this is how we in Minnesota think all of you in San Francisco walk. <laughs> ooh, stepped on a needle. Okay, well, I got an app that tells me where the hepatitis clinics are. <laughs> Approve the privacy policy, right? CBD, essential oils, hepatitis treatment. There's, a, there's an app for that. In other words, we think you're kind of crazy when it comes to that. But not this part of everything. This part is beautiful, and I love being here. I really do. It's extraordinary. And again, you know, when she called and said, uh, would you like to come? This was March. March, would you like to come in January? Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm open. <laughs> Good move. What would you like to talk about? I'm walking around the building, as she's called, having a little cigar in my corporate office place, and I said, oh, I don't know. Uh, the elites and why they hate the rest of America. How about that? I can probably say something about that. So, and then, of course, I forgot all about it. And she calls me a little while later, a couple of weeks ago, and says, what would you, remember, uh, what would you like to talk about? You want to flesh that out a little bit? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I want to talk about a word that has been occurring to me more and more recently. The more I listen to the Democrats, the more I listen to their policy proposals, the more I listen to their vision of what they want for the country, there's this one word that keeps coming to me. And that word is no. <laughs> Say it with me. No, 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 no. And she says, that's great, but we kind of printed the posters, and the flyers. So I said, all right, I will take these two ideas, why the elites hate the rest of America or don't like them, and no, and we'll see if I can mush them together into a successful speech. We'll know when my timer goes off here. All right, so the first part, the elites. And the elites versus America. First of all, we have to figure out who are the elites exactly. I think we know. Um, they're the people who went to very important colleges and got very important degrees on very important matters and spent all of their time in a particular intellectual bubble where everything that they have ever believed is reinforced by everyone else and they're better than those poor benighted souls out there who sit in front of their large television sets and watch shows about dancing and NASCAR and the rest. I mean, they're the people who generally consider themselves to be smarter and better than everybody else. 
And they're f sort of frequently appalled at the fact that they're not running the show. This is not to say that there isn't a good thing to be had said for expertise. There's a Twitter guy, Tom Nichols, who wrote a book called The Death of Expertise, in which he spends a lot of his time on Twitter just sort of saying, well, I'm an expert, and you should listen to experts. Well, there are different kinds of expertise. One kind of expertise is the guy who says, in my considered expertise about the Middle East, I would advise against hitting Suleimani because of the disorder and the done ease that it would start in the Middle Eastern community. That's one kind of expertise. There's another kind of expertise that says, I know exactly how to make him a smoking hole filled with jam. <laughs> one is intellectual and the other is technical and practical. But there's also the elite of the young folk who just don't seem to know much. They're pretty proud of themselves and their accomplishments. They probably went to a nice school. They probably lived in a nice neighborhood. They're probably nice people. But they believe that they're actually got something on the rest of us because they went to these places and they're blue checked on Twitter and they write for a very important website that nobody goes to that tells everybody else how to live. There are so many of these young people on Twitter and they're so intent on telling you how we ought to run our lives. My favorite though was a gentleman, probably in his late 20s, who tweeted out something that was a great self-own and a self-reveal. He was at, he had a window seat and he was looking down and there was something very strange down on the ground. So he took out his phone and he took a picture of it and he tweeted it from the sky and said, Guys, I know there's probably an explanation for this pattern that I'm seeing, but what is it? And people told him that what he was seeing were farms. <laughs> the lines were roads, the green stuff was crops, the other stuff that was a different color of green was a different crop. The strange circles were irrigation. They're farms. That's where your food comes from. So here's a guy who probably, if his editor said, I want you to give me 500 words on the historical roots of racism and agricultural traditions in America and why the John Deere Tractor Company actually collaborated with the Nazis or something like that. <laughs> He'd dash it off thinking, I got this. But when it comes to looking down and actually recognizing literal America, he couldn't do it. That's a mild example. My favorite, though, the last year had to do with a fellow who you may not be surprised has subsequently locked his Twitter account so that nobody else gets to see his deathless wisdom. And uh, I'm going to read from uh, an article in Breitbart, which summed it up. UC Berkeley instructor Jackson Kiernan said that, quote, Rural Americans are bad people, in a recent tweet. Kernian, a graduate student studying philosophy, has taught 10 courses at Berkeley over the past few years. Quote, I unironically embrace the bashing of rural Americans. They, as a group, are bad people who have made bad life decisions. Some, I assume, are good people, but this nostalgia for some imagined pastoral way of life is stupid, and we should shame people who aren't pro-city. In a follow-up tweet, he wrote, It should be uncomfortable to live in rural America. It should be uncomfortable to not move. He went on to note that uh, everything should be expensive in the rural areas because the cities are efficient, and people who go and live in these places are just bad people. People. So you wonder, wh what does he want them to do exactly? I come actually from the state of North Dakota, and our family is still plowing and sowing and reaping from ground that was broken by our ancestors in the family, the first people to ever break the, the soil of the prairie and, uh, and put the seeds in. And my cousin, if you saw my cousin driving down the road in his Harley Davidson with some fringe on his leather bag, you'd think, hey, there's some dirtball meth dealer. No, he is actually a board member in a multi-million dollar co-op, and he runs the family farm. He gets the tractor out there, he puts the plants, he deals with all the things that farmers have to do, which is bookkeeping and, and, and meteorology. It's an amazingly intense and intellectually demanding profession, physically so too. It leaves you a wreck at the end of the day. It's hard work to farm. At the end of it, you get food and everybody likes food, including these people who write these tweets. But what does this guy who thinks that rural America should empty out exactly want my cousin to do? Does he want him to burn his house, raise the barn, sell the equipment, let the stock loose, go to the Maple Cheyenne Church? 
church in the edge of town, say a final farewell to all the relatives in the boneyard, and then go to the big city where he would do what? Code a web page about how to get Medicare for all? What do they want him to do? They just don't want to hear about him. They just don't want to think about them. Because the interesting people you see live in cities. Now, I live in a city. I live in a big city. And I love cities. Cities are great. But liberals seem to love cities for different reasons. And they seem to love cities, well, they love European cities more than anything else. Have you ever noticed this? Oh, gosh, because European cities have history. Yes, they have bloody, miserable, feudal, revolutionary history. But, you know, they got history. But they have sustainable cities where everybody rides bikes. I mean, you swear, you take one of these people at a certain age, an impressionable liberal, and put them in Amsterdam, and they see everybody riding their bikes along the canals to work, and it's just like, oh, can you, why can't we all have this? <sighs> well... If I was young, I would love to live in a small flat and bike to work for a little while. It's lovely, very nice, but at some point, the American in you would swell up and you would say, do I really want to be 40 years old living in a flat the size of a motel room with a refrigerator the size of R2-D2? <laughs> no, I want land spreading out so far and wide I want a house. I don't want anybody upstairs, downstairs, on either side of me. I want to be my own person in my own place. Now, New York City, don't get me wrong, American cities are fantastic. I love New York, I love Chicago, I love the architecture, the museums, all the rest of it. New York, I can take us only so much before I say you win. But Chicago is endlessly fascinating. Minneapolis, a reasonable sized city, is a great place. But here's the thing, I'm not better because I prefer the city over the rural. And all these people who live in New York who think they're better because they live in New York, well, you just want to say, uh, what's the phrase? You didn't build that. You are, in essence, a tourist here like everybody else just for a little bit longer. I mean, yeah, there's exposure to other cultures, and that's great. But the people who live in big cities fail to realize that in a small town, you will have exposure to cultures that are different as well. You'll have Germans, Poles, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes. I know it's not the same. But it's diversity as we have it. Okay, by other cultures, sometimes they meet food, right? In New York, you can get Thai food at 3 o'clock in the morning which is really awesome, but not necessarily you know, a key ingredient of my life to be happy. And if I want Thai food at 3 o'clock in the morning, well, I can get up and I can make it in my kitchen. But they don't want that. They don't want that because I'm probably going to be using gas to cook that Thai food, and gas contributes to global warming. We can't do that. Your whole kit, the fact that you have a kitchen at all is wrong. The fact that your kitchen is that big is wrong. It's unsustainable. The planet is on fire. No, it's not. We only have 12 years. The cities are going to be underwater. So you want all the people from the Midwest to move to the cities so they can drown. <laughs> but what do we can't go on like this? Oh, oh, but we can. We, we can. And we will. And it'll get better if we keep you guys on the left from having total control of everything. Which brings us to the healing power of no. You can clap if you wish. <laughs> I was having a conversation with a friend of mine at work who's a good liberal. He thinks I'm a good conservative. We say that because neither of us is particularly, you know, we agree with some things that he says and he likes some of the things that I say. And we have very civilized conversations. They're like the Christmas truce in World War I. <laughs> you know, we think we'll probably be at each other's throats if it comes to that. But, you know, it doesn't. And here we are outside. You're having your cigarette. I'm having my cigar. It's a great time. We're talking. And he says casually. Well, I think Trump did that because Trump's just a playing to what his base wants. And I said, Real? well, what does his base want? Well, you know, his base is racist. Really? Yeah, it's interesting because we over here in the classical liberal side are the, we're still the last remnant of the content of character thing, whereas you guys are absolutely obsessed with figuring out what percentage of somebody is of this so I can understand them through that prism. And you're all about skin color and eye shape, so um, uh, you, you seem to kind of have that race thing going. Well, the, the right's authoritarian. That's my favorite. I love to hear that so much. Really? We're authoritarian. <clears throat> Dude, everything about your side is authoritarian. Now, they don't like that because they like to think of themselves as still sort of 60s up against the wall establishment man types. But no, everything you are about is about taking stuff away. 
taking things away, forcing people to be poorer, ruining our choices, making everybody poorer except for the people who happen to be running the show. You want to take away my plastic straws? You probably already have taken them here, haven't you? Right. You want to take my hamburger? Pete Buttigieg says that if you eat a hamburger when it comes to global warming, well, you're kind of the problem, which tells me they want to take away my hamburger. They took away the chemicals that made my dishwasher work. They took away my incandescent bulbs. Okay, that was our guy. They want to take away my hot shower. Seriously. Read a piece the other day online in a journal devoted to sustainable sustainability, and they were all talking about the, uh, the impact of the, of, the, of the hot shower. It's unsustainable. It would take the entire world's wind power capacity to supply a hot shower for everyone on the planet for five minutes. And you think, well, we can stagger them, can't we? No, no, we just, we don't have the energy. So there are two things we can do to keep from dying in a climate apocalypse when it comes to our showers. And it's like, how do you people live? Okay, what are they? One of them is the Navy shower. Any Navy guys here? Yeah, jumping up and down in cold water. That's great for two, three minutes. The other was to replace your nozzles, which give you that wonderful flow with mist. But the problem was that if you increase the entire geothermal and, electric and, and, um, and sustainable power, we could still only provide a five-minute shower with three misting heads. But if we cut it down to two, and this guy's like, I've done it, I've saved the planet. I've cut it down to two misting heads. So what they're saying then is that in order to save the world, which is going to you know, evaporate at any possible second here, what we have to do is retrofit every single shower head in the Western world to emit two small little spittle things that comes at you. Because as we all know, everybody who's come from a hard day at the, of working or mowing the lawn says, boy, I could really use a good, hot, pounding, tepid misting right about now. <laughs> you know, and he looks at me like I'm crazy. So I have to pull out some other big guns. All right, okay, maybe you don't want to take away my shower, but you do. You want to take away my health care? And they will say, what do you mean? We want to give everybody health care. I said, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, what you want to do, your guys, uh, Warren and Sanders, is you want to take away our health care. And I'm talking look, tiny to this guy. I said, union guy to union guy, because we're both union guys, I said. What they are talking about there is abrogating, but using the force of government to abrogate and nullify the deal that our union struck with our employer for our insurance. You want to talk authoritarian? They're going to come in and say that contract that we fought for is null and void. And is our, what is, our union, is our union actually going to take my money and use it to support Bernie Sanders, who wants to take away what the union got us? And he got this look that I get from a lot of people in my industry when I say this. Wow, that's a really good point. And you realize it's because they don't think these wonderful things will affect them. Oh, but they will. There's so many other no's. And you know, obviously, I'm making up the conversation from this point on because we're not standing out there for 35 you know, minutes talking about this. And perhaps I'm arguing a little bit in the shower or in the car, but over a while, you begin to, there are things that come to you that you want to say to people sometimes, honestly, when you talk to somebody on the left. I'm not talking to people who are sort of, you know, sort of nice and liberal, but people who are on the left. You want to say, no, no, you can't have my First Amendment. And again, they'll be appalled. What do you mean? We don't want to take your First Amendment. We're all about free speech. No, you're not. Well, Donald Trump said the press is the enemy of the people. And I don't like that either, frankly. I'm in the press. I'm not the enemy. I know a lot of people who do great jobs in the press. They're not the enemy of the people. But, 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 but. What has he done? And I ask my friends. I say, okay, let's take a look at some of your icons here. Let's take it FDR. FDR, when the press was writing some things that were not too complimentary about the uh, New Deal, what did FDR do? FDR sort of kind of got behind a black commission in the Senate which said we're going to figure out whether or not the reporters are talking to people in industries because the industries don't like the New Deal because the industries are all fascists, they use the term. Uh, so we're going to investigate every reporter in the country and they sent government operatives to Western Union to collect every single telegram that had ever passed before the news organizations and industry. Five million of them. No warrant. They just took them. 
And then they stick the Justice Department on the reporters to see if they've gotten any money from any of the people that they were talking about. In other words, were their finances and their taxes up to date? So if you can imagine if Donald Trump confiscated without warrant every email that has passed between a reporter and somebody else and took the bank records and the IRS records, oh, wait a minute, a president's sicking the IRS. And so, yeah. No, that could never happen. That would constitute, I would say, something of an authoritarianism, but they worship FDR, so they never will. After that little initiative went nowhere, one of FDR's um, minions in the Senate came up with another great idea. Let's pass a law that will put somebody in jail for publishing a news story that turns out not to be true. In other words, fake news. And eventually that kibosh, got kiboshed too, and FDR said, yeah, it's not worth it. But at a press conference, they asked FDR how he felt about this bill that would peop, put people to jail for publishing something that wasn't true. And FDR said, rough quote, he said, well, there isn't enough money in the federal budget to build enough jails for all you guys. <laughs> but you know you asked for it. That's what FDR, their hero, said to the press. Imagine Donald Trump coming out and saying, there's not enough money in the budget to build enough prisons for you journalists. The sprinkler systems in every newsroom would go off from the hair that are up there. But it, it, even if you don't talk about it, that freedom of speech, First Amendment, they don't like the First Amendment, they hate it. They've carved out this thing called hate speech. Hate speech is disagreement. If you come and make a speech that does not accept their premises, then you are speaking hate speech because the act of arguing supposes that this argument is not valid and people feel challenged by that and words they've now defined as violence. So if words are violence, then a certain kind of speech is actually assault and is not protected speech under the First Amendment. Ha! Yes, it is. There's no such thing. But you can't take that away from me. I mean, the words that you can't even use anymore, for example. It's, it's the difficulty that somebody has in stating what used to be known as basic scientific truth about male-female gender identities is simply you can't say it anymore without fearing that a mob is going to come down and demand your scalp and get you fired from your job. And if the Democrats who love and lord JFK, can they imagine JFK saying, I uh, do believe this nation should uh, commit to the idea that uh, men can have penises and that men cannot give birth. It would be absurd. But if Kennedy, of course, had not agreed with that, he would have been canceled. Oh, and money? Money, right? Free speech is money, right? Um, me giving money to somebody, somebody spending money is a form of speech. And we're told that because of Citizens United that that's wrong and we have to get rid of Citizens United because money, as speech, corrupts politics. Well, Mike Bloomberg has spent $200 million so far. And I assume because of that we're all, must vote Mike Bloomberg now? No, because we have brains. We can think. They can spend as much money as they like. We're not going to buy it. So when it comes to the First Amendment, <laughs> you guys want to take away my First Amendment. And you know what I say? How about, the, how about the Second Amendment, though? <laughs> I was never a gun guy. I'm not a gun guy. I grew up with guns all over the place, though. My dad took me out shooting when I was a kid because that's what you did in North Dakota. You took your little bookish kid out, let him feel it, you know, do it. And we went out to pop off at some prairie dogs. And, you know, prairie dogs are so cute. The way they stick their heads up. Yeah, I know. But they're pests. They make holes and the stock walks along and gets its foot, and the, you know, hoof in the hole and cracks it. And so you go shoot prairie dogs. And my dad took me out and taught me how to hold, how to squeeze, how to, how to brace for the recoil and the rest of it. And a prairie dog pops his head up. And what struck me at the time was, this isn't fair, really. I mean, the guy's just checking the mail, you know. <laughs> but that was hunting culture. Uh, my dad hunted. All my uncles hunted. Everybody had rifles downstairs hanging on the wall. When my, my father died this last summer, I was going through his, his effects. I found a sheaf of photographs from a hunting trip they'd taken in the 1950s. All my uncles and my dad, with all their hunting camouflage, with all their rifles, six-point buck, and they put a cigarette in his mouth and put a bottle of Jack Daniels right next to him. <laughs> and they're all laughing. And I thought, now, Peter would get them from desecrating the corpse, is what Peter would say. But that was the culture of the time. I don't share it at all. But here's the distinction. I do not confuse my, my own personal lack of interest with, the, with my need to demonize it for everybody else. And because I grew up around guns and was taught to respect guns and expected to see them in the back of the pickup or in the side hanging in somebody's wall, we all did. And we all knew that they didn't leap into your hands and turn you into a murderer. 
They were tools to be respected. So I've never made the connection between my own personal feelings about it and, the, and a fear of guns that the Democrats and the liberals, liberals seem to have. Um, and they seem to believe that laws are going to be able to save us all. And they know, I believe, that that's not the case. It just isn't. That the only thing that they're going to have to do, and if you ask them about this eventually, like Beto, they'll say, hell yes, we're coming for them, is to ban them all and then to come and get them. And whether or not they've thought out exactly what it's like to have to go house to house in every house in America and look through every single cupboard drawer and every closet and under the floorboards and in the attic to find it, and even then they'll only find a third of them, I don't think they think that. I think they just really like the idea of taking them away from people they don't like. So, you want to forbid me the means to defend myself? No. And then there's the Green New Deal. <laughs> you want to fundamentally disrupt, destroy, re-alter, transform the entire America uh, economy and the way that we live. Oh gosh, where do we start? Well, let's start with cars because they don't want me to have a car. I don't know what it's like out here, but in Minnesota there's a constant theme that cars cannot be privileged and cars must be discouraged. Um, there are two big lanes going in and out of downtown Minneapolis. Traffic at rush hour, it's filled, people move along. It's an efficient way to get people where they were. But what the new urbanists didn't like was the fact that there was no bike lane in this very busy part of traffic. So they removed a lane of traffic and put in a bike lane, which I can tell you, based on daily observation, is occupied by exactly zero people between the hours of 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. In the morning, you may have somebody in the snow with a fat tire chugging along, but you don't really have many people use it. But it makes everybody feel good to know that it's there because we're always placed high in a list of top 10 sustainable bike-friendly cities. What effect it has means nothing. What counts is that cars have been punished. And I was on a Reddit discussion board about a minor little traffic realteration that was going on in my neighborhood and everybody was saying, yeah, it's not really going to change anything. But the point is to make it inconvenient for people to drive. And they say this proudly, openly. And I love when they say that part. We want to make it hard and bad for people to drive. Now, I believe in public transportation, in bus systems. I do. Uh, I think a, a good, healthy city is going to have a lot of buses that take people everywhere. But um, cars are... Freedom, people. Cars are you wanting to do what you want to do and go where you want to go. And I think that might be part of the reason that they hate them. So what they want, of course, um, is me to get tired of all the impediments that they put in the way of driving a car. And they want me to move into a sustainable, dense building on a light rail line. And that every day, instead of getting in my car and going out to the suburbs and taking the kids here and then to soccer practice and then picking that up and then going to the grocery store and then I got to go over there and pick up a 15 pound bag of dog food because the dog food's almost always, they're angry about the fact that I have a dog. You shouldn't have a dog. The carbon impact of the dog is too big. Why do you need 15 pounds of that? Why don't you get a half size bag? Why don't you get a smaller dog? Why don't you get a hamster? Why don't you get a, why don't you recycle a sock that's fuzzy and just use that as your pet? No, you got to have a big dog and a big house. <sighs> They want me to live in this four-story, dense, plywood-walled building along a light rail train and then every day trudge off to the co-op with my hemp bag <laughs> and then come back with my organic arugula and have my lunch. No. I mean, if you want to, that's great. Minneapolis right now is having a boom. We've got tons of new apartment buildings going up. They're huge, and they're along the light rail. We got big skyscrapers going up downtown with fantastic apartment buildings because Minneapolis is a beautiful city and people want to live there and be close to the restaurants and the theater and the rest of it. That's great. That's their choice. That's their choice. The problem is, of course, is that a lot of these people who are going into these places are either young folk with no kids or they're old folk, people who's empty nesters, who are tired of having a house. The minute you get hitched and you get some kids, they're out of there. And where do they want to go? They want to go to the suburbs. They want to go to the suburbs, and this exactly is what furiates the left even more. Because they hate the suburbs. They hate them. Every, it's been 50, 60 years. Remember that old stupid folk song about ticky tacky boxes all the same? I listen to that and I think, you ungrateful brat. 
Your parents probably lived in some cold water walk up in Brooklyn somewhere. It was built in 1865, and it was noisy, and it stunk of cabbage in the hallways, and the sub subways rattled, and the city of New York was dirty in the 60s. They moved you out to Levittown, and it was paradise. It really was, compared to where you were. And they had, you had room to roam and run free, and your folks had a place of their own. That was a good thing post-war. Now, we're told, of course, that we were all sold the myth of the suburbs by, by propaganda, by uh, the car industry, by the highway lobby. Like, no one in their right mind would want to go and live in a suburb far from New York City. <laughs> uh, yeah, they would, and they did. <laughs> Problem is, of course, is that the suburbs have a racist past. They do. Redlining and the rest of it. And as we all know, anything that had a racist past must be held accountable for that in the present. Unless it's the Robert E. Byrd Senior Center, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson Policy Center for Initiative. So they see the suburbs then as these places with, a, with a, a racist pedigree, and they're places of stifling conformity. When the left looks at suburbs, it's still as if they think that Betty Friedan is sitting doing housework you know, over the kitchen, and that nobody has any possibility of any sort of fruitful life out there, which is their failure of their, their imaginations. They see them as places where people go about their lives without constantly performing some sort of social penance, you know. Just by living in a suburb, you are perpetuating iniquity and in inequality, and you're probably making Australia burn and everything else, too. Now, in a free society, people tend to sort by culture and economic status, right? But market forces keep somebody who's 18 and poor from living in the mansion district by the lakes. It's just the way the world works. But the left believes that this is unjust because it is unequal, and they want to use the force of the state to arrange neighborhoods in a way that is, conforms to what they think a society should be. Hence, the end, at least in my city, of single-family housing, at least in the zoning. They've done away with it. Used to be a neighborhood with single family, that's what you could build. Now they say, no, people should build duplexes, quadplexes, octoplexes. We need density. Density. Density is good. Single family, bad. All those people living in that self-contained little unit there, why, they're forming bonds amongst themselves instead of to the greater community, and we can't have that. So we need more density. So single family, the very idea of the single home as an unsustainable ecological catastrophe or something that keeps people in constrained social situations. The left hates the suburbs. But <clears throat> you think you're going to get rid of the suburbs? No. No. They also want me to not get on a plane. They want me to take trains everywhere. Um, the last time I took Amtrak, I remember, it was a perfect, perfect metaphor for the whole thing. I got in my first class compartment, opened up a little bottle of wine, wondered why the train wasn't moving, <laughs> started to smell something, opened up a container, it was a used baby diaper from the previous occupants, sat there for 35 minutes with my wine and the stench going nowhere. Biden Express. I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. They want to take away my money. Of course, that goes without saying. They want to take away my electoral vote. <laughs> Mike Bloomberg, as I mentioned, showed up in Minnesota this last month uh, and had to sit there and pretend not to scream as people were showing him salty fries and things. <laughs> the only reason he went to Minnesota is all because of their electoral vote. You want me to give up my voice in the national conversation and be dictated to by New York and California and the rest of it? You want me to give up my vote? You want to give up my electoral vote and, and cede everything to these liberal enclaves? No! Of course, you're California. I might have expected you to say the yes to that one. <laughs> so here's the thing. I say to the left, you can't have any of these things. First Amendment, Second Amendment, my suburbs, my house, my car, my dog, my gas stove, all of these things. You can't have any of them. And you know what that makes me and my kind? The resistance or as they call them, the Nazis, right? But they say, you, but, but they say, no. You'll get a sustainable planet if we do all these things. Otherwise, we die. You know, I was talking to my daughter the other day because she's 19 and reads a lot of stuff and is worried from time to time of the news she hears. And I said, listen, global warming, I don't know. Mankind contributed to it a bit? Probably. I don't know. Is it going to mean the end of all life on, on, on this earth? No. 
do, do we know whether or not it comes from the density of carbon gases or whether or not there's thermal venting in the ocean or whether or not it might not have something to do with that big, huge yellow nuclear furnace in the sky you see from time to time, sunspots and the rest of it? We don't know. We'll find out. But don't worry. Don't worry, I wanted to tell her because when I was her age, when I was my daughter's age, when I was in high school, uh, junior high, 72, 73, we were constantly in fear of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which were going to, dis which we didn't think we were going to get to grow up frankly. It was either going to be overpopulation was going to kill us, people were going to be crawling over each other in all the cities and scrambling for the last piece of Soylent Green. <laughs> Pollution was going to kill us. There was, I, I, I still have a menu that I kept from the Howard Johnson's restaurant, the kids menu, telling about how if we didn't do something about pollution, that the sun's rays would not penetrate to the earth and all life would cease. This is the kids menu. In the 70s, although we called it ecology back then, uh, we were worried about nuclear war. We were convinced that the Soviet Union was going to blow us up. There's just, just, you know, no other point to it. Uh, and we were convinced, of course, also, I said to my daughter, about uh, the, uh, the forthcoming Ice Age. And she said, what do you mean Ice Age? <laughs> so I got out the documentary that I love to show people about the coming Ice Age. It's got climate scientists walking around with core samples, talking about how it's never been this cold. It's never been this, the, everything has changed and it'll never go back. This is the new normal. They got a guy standing there in Alaska sa somewhere saying, and last summer, none of this even melted. <laughs> We're supposed to be horrified. And he said, when we talk to the Inuits, they say their fathers, fathers, fathers have never known weather this cold. And they showed a map of the glaciers that would cover America. And it came to North Dakota. I'm freaking out as a kid, you know. Because woolly mammoths were going to be stamping around again. And none of that happened. Now, the thing with the pollution, I mean, pollution got better because we did something about it. We did something sensible about it and smart. And everybody worked together. And that was great. That's fantastic. And that's what we need to do in the future. We need to work together. And we need to figure out the sensible, smart things to do. And not panic. My daughter's generation, everything about her is keyed to making them panic. But we don't have to do that. One last thing. Um, when I drive back and forth to Fargo, I go up and down this unsustainable road. I'm sure it's completely unsustainable. Cars everywhere. Agriculture everywhere. You know, <laughs> Tractors that aren't even using wind power. <laughs> I mean, they could hook up some sails, for gosh sakes. But no, pff, fossil fuels for me. <laughs> And it's, it, it's Highway 10. It was the main intersection between Fargo and Minneapolis before the freeways came along. And I always take it because it has all of the small towns. And they're all spaced in certain ways. They're spaced in ways so that if you, if you worked on the farm on Saturday when you went into town, this was the day's trip. So they have a certain amount of space. And there's a big town, and then there's a small one, and so forth. I always like to stop at a little place called Verndale. It's about halfway. And I have a cup of coffee that I got down at the gas station and a small little cigar. And uh, it's got a small little park with a band shell and a water tower that says Verndale on it. And there's a tool store across the street from the park. And what I love to do is sit there sometimes and watch the Amish come in because the Amish will trot in sometimes on the weekends, do their shopping. And then periodically a train will thunder past. Huge, immense diesel powered train, 60 cars bringing goods from there to there, crashing past, going right past this imperturbable, unflappable horse with a buggy who just sits there. And then some days, to complete the picture of American bliss, they will have one of those blowing balloon things that, you know. <laughs> so between that guy and the Amish and the train, I'm happy. But the other thing that I always like about this is there's a World War I monument. And it's, it's great. It's, it's, this, it's about this big. It's concrete, plinth, painted white. And it has a plaque with all the names of all the kids, all the boys who fought in World War I. Or the Great War because they didn't know about the whole next one. And it has two globes on either side of it that are 100 years old that glow and illuminate this in the dark. And 100 years, it's remarkable how long it's stayed there. Well, when I went back last April, uh, one of the globes was shattered. And I thought, oh boy, there's a metaphor maybe for small town decline. Is that just gonna sit there with an empty thing with no light? How long before the other one goes? And I felt bad, because Verndale is not exactly a bustling town. I think it's about 750, 800 people. 
I went back two months later. There were two new lights, solar powered. They'd fixed it. The town had chipped in. And there was a guy painting the gazebo there. And I asked him, what happened with the light? He said, uh, summer festival. Some of the kids got a little rambunctious. But everybody chipped in and fixed it. And now for the next hundred years, there will be light shining down on these names. Um, the boys on all, you know, we say, we said a lot of no here tonight, but the boys on that plaque were the sort of people who say yes. And the coastal elites <laughs> that we've been talking about depend on the men and women from these flyover places to say yes, to step up, to volunteer, and say yes. I don't want to be the guy who says no. Okay? I want us to be the people who say yes. Yes to a prosperous future based on the ideals that have got us thus far. No is where we start. It's where we push back. Yes is where we want to go to convince everybody, convince them, bring them with us and convince them that the cause of liberty and prosperity is still worth fighting for. Do I have a yes? yes. Did I bring my two themes together successfully? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, by the way, oh, are we still? Please. The friend that I talked to, by the way, outside when we go out and have our cigar and cigarette, um, he's a son of immigrant parents. Uh, hard working guys who came here speaking no English and they're not professionals and they live in Iowa. And the son is a good liberal, but his parents, <laughs> and he said to, his whore, to my whore, he said, My parents watch Fox. And he said, and they're mad about the immigrants. <laughs> and he would say, but dad, we're immigrants. And he said, yeah, but it's the people who come here and don't want to adapt to the culture. And he said, um, and the last time I was home, everybody was talking, you know, they were getting angry about the war on Christmas. My dad was talking about the war on Christmas. And my friend said, dad, we're Hindu. <laughs> But I love that guy because he understood the issues at heart and there's just something in America, something so American about a guy, a Hindu guy in Iowa getting angry on behalf of the war on Christmas anyway. <laughs> okay, well we have a couple of questions already for James up here. James, uh, a democratic debate uh, is rumored to be going on tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not that anyone's watching, but any thoughts on the, um, essential, the eventual nominee and who would you like to see and what do you, who do you think will win? Oh. I'm the last guy to ask this because I mean who who do I when you say who would I like to win the nomination it would be who do I who would I like to see the floor mopped up with the most efficiently <laughs> right who do I want to see completely reveal the intellectual paucity of their of their policies and make the party unelectable for another three or four years that depends I mean part of me wants Bernie Sanders part of me wants him out there shouting about social I somebody who, I because if we do we get to see I hope if the media did their job all the video of Bernie saying yes yes I've been to Russia Russia and I want to see him defend Castro and Nicaragua and the Soviet Union and the rest of it and say that's who they put up that's their guy now I I'd like to see that but on the other hand, I'm horrified that something might happen and the candidate that no one expected to wins, wins. It's not like we haven't seen that happen before. So I don't know what that would be. And again, I just think a lot of people say, well, he'll be, you know, it's like he'll have, right, Barack Obama had Joe Biden because, Joe, because Barack Obama was untested, but Joe Biden brought gravitas <laughs> and that insider DC know-how. And uh, so you always try to pair the, the outsider candidate with somebody else. And I'm thinking that if they put Amy Klobuchar as the running mate for Bernie Sanders, people would say, well, she'll keep him from being too socialist. You know, she'll throw a hairbrush at him or something or spill soup in his lap or whatever. Um, in the interest of a sane country, I would like a sane Democrat candidate in the mold who did not believe in the confiscation of all monies and liberties, but that apparently is too much to ask for these days. <laughs> And anyway, I like, Amy, I like Amy Klobuchar because we exchange Christmas cards. How about that? <laughs> well, that's lovely. <laughs> I like her. 
Um, you know, you made a prison reference a while ago, and there are a couple I of did. questions here. Uh, a, a member of the Bernie Sanders campaign was caught on tape by Project Veritas yes. today, right? Yeah. And they, they, wanna, um, they said the gulags weren't so bad. Yeah, right. right? Project Veritas, James O'Keefe, uh, had a guy, and I don't know why anybody talks to anybody anymore with, with, Keefe, with Keefe out there, really. I mean, my wife comes home and asks me a political question, and I check her on for tapes. <laughs> You've been talking to Keith. You got a phone under there. Is this going to be some undershot where it's me coming up? Um, but Keith's operatives got somebody from the Bernie Sanders campaign or somebody tangentially connected to it or whatever. They'll find a way to, to, to wave it away saying, um, yeah, what we need to do, first of all, is have re-education camps with these bleeping Nazis who are on the right, which is everybody to them. And the other was, you know, they talk about gulags. Gulags weren't that bad, the guy says. Uh, they got minimum wage. They got conjugal visits. And I'm thinking, you know, I've heard a lot of arguments for Bernie, but I think the idea that I might be able to see my wife when I go to the camp might be the one that puts me over on the Sanders side. <laughs> but will we have any of these questions asked? No, because the craziest, stupidest, wide bleepinest person out there who does something in the name of Donald Trump or the right or anything that is not on the left will be held up as emblematic as of the core of the right. Period. The craziest person on the left who does something that is actually the purest expression of what the left actually means will be dismissed as an outlier. That's the way it always is. Am I right? Okay. Okay, to continue the theme of punishment. Um, <laughs> the theme of punishment. <laughs> Welcome to the theme of punishment. We are all good Republicans, yes, right? I can't quite uh, read this card, but there's a, a question about, you know, Stalin took five years to kill the first million citizens, and how long do you think it'll take for us to be punished for thought crimes by... Uh, if the left is in charge. Um, how long will it take for us to be punished? You mean we're not already punished by thought for thought crime? Um, I mean, that's the thing. The, the, the left hates how much Orwell actually reflects more on them than it does on us. Um, because, again, instruments of state control and the, and the control of language. Orwell's brilliant observation was that you, if you control language, you control what ideas can be expressed and what ideas can be even conceived. If there is not a word for something, if you have taken that word away and trained a population to no longer be able to conceive of that word and its meanings, you have eliminated that thing. So, I mean, we see this now. There are just some things that you're not allowed to say, um, and they're mostly about S-E-X and gender and the rest of it. And people are terrified, frankly, because unless you're Ricky Gervais and already have a contract with Netflix, chances, I mean, J.K. Rowling's, J.K. Rowling's, who made 78, 11 billion dollars on Harry Potter and has millions of fans, billions of everybody in the world is a Harry Potter fan. J.K. Rowling's comes out in support of somebody who is making a point about British law. British law has something called, they're, they're toying with the concept of self-ID, which means that if you want to change genders, all you have to do is say, I am that. I'm not this, this anymore, I'm that. That's all you have to do. No chemicals, no must, no fuss, no perm, no surgery. If you say that's what you are, that's what you are. And there are a lot of women, a lot of feminist women, a lot of leftist feminist women, who are being described as virtual Nazi harpy Valkyries from Hitler hell because they believe that there's a biological essence to femininity and womanhood and that you can't just say, I'm a woman. You gotta kinda go through stuff and you gotta have some stuff. That's their opinion, and they're called TERFs, trans-excluding radical feminists, and they're hated. They're absolutely hated. So, J, so J.K. Rawlings comes out in defense of somebody who was saying, J.K. Rawlings' sin was to defend somebody for saying what I just said, that women are women and men are men, and that you shouldn't be fired for that. But Rawlings was excoriated and canceled and cast away on Twitter because she was defending an idea, she, not because she would even espoused it. And she'd said all these things in, the, in all the language of inclusion and trans rights and the rest of it, but because she had sided with the people who had, didn't think you should be fired for turfism, that's it. She's done. So yeah, how long will it take until we're there? Yeah, we're there. <laughs> Turfs. Okay. You haven't heard that one? I, I haven't. Trans excluding we're, 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 we're a little behind out here, clearly. Okay. <laughs> so, um, any chance the audience wants to know if Minnesota could go for Trump? Yes. Yes. There are, there are, there are two things that have to happen. And by the way, um, just keep your eye on the clock and you know, come over and kick me in the shins anytime we're done here. Cause no problem, because I, I identify as a worldwide wrestling okay. um, <laughs> right. dude. So. 
I know you got places to go and debates and rallies to see. Me too. Uh, could Minnesota, Minnesota got darn purple, and I don't just mean Vikings-wise. And by the way, that game, uh, <laughs> God, you beat us so fair and square. It is not like we didn't show up. If we hadn't shown up, that would have been that would have been okay. We showed up. We just weren't good enough, and we got pounded. And I wish you all the best, and hope uh, you lose when you get to. <laughs> So the Vikings, not the Vikings, so Minnesota w got pretty darn purple. And it got purple because outstate was tired of being told, you know, greater Minnesota, as we now call it, was tired of being dictated to by a culturally different city. The city is like all other cities. It's progressive, it's liberal in its core, and that affects policies and it spreads out. And the people in the rural areas and the smaller municipalities did not feel as though the city represented them anymore because the values were not just, you know, they weren't alien. It's just like, you guys are nuts. You're banning pla <laughs> Come on. I mean, we, we, you know, we need help out here. Can you not ban plastic straws? Can you get some help? Um, and so it was close. And after the election, I had people in my newsroom who knew that I'm sort of like, I'm one of those. That's, that's the guy. Uh, came over and they were saying, we didn't see it coming. We really didn't. And our newspaper, to its credit, sent reporters all over the state to just sit down, shut up, and listen. And they got an earful from people who were tired of being ignored by the policymakers in the state. So if those people stick with Trump, and even though the agricultural thing has hit hard, and a lot of people you know, don't like that fact, they still have a basic understanding of what's going on in a trade war with, tr with China and why it needs to be perhaps waged and why we need to get our power bargaining and IP protection back. Um, and they also know that the people who don't like Trump really don't like them either. There's a lot of sentiment for that. So that's the first thing. Those people have to stay with Trump for Minnesota to go, to go red. And the second thing is that a large thermonuclear device has to fall on Minneapolis-St. Paul. <laughs> and I would like advance warning of that if I could so that I could be outside of the blast radius. But it could happen. Okay. Um, with all the negatives associated with Twitter, are you in favor or against the government getting involved in regulating it? The government regulating Twitter? Oh, that would be just wonderful for everybody, wouldn't it be? We, the, government getting the government getting involved in Twitter? Okay, first of all, this would start out as one little small office somewhere on Capitol Hill, and then 10 years later would be a big, huge, sprawling office complex, <laughs> the Twitter division, which would never, ever go away, all right? You would have all these people who would be tasked with looking at every single tweet to see if it met exacting government standards, comparing it to a national database to cross-run it against this to see whether or not there's terrorists, to see whether or not there's hate speak, to see whether or not this is Russian bots at work. And then, 15, 20 years later, the Twitter division, the, the, the Bureau of Twitter, the BOT, which would now have a 14-story building that had moved to Arlington because they don't have the height uh, requirements. So the Bureau of Twitter is now in Arlington. It's 14 stories. So everybody's been working there for an awful long time. They got their budget approved for the next year, which has a 17% increase over the previous years, but they're calling it a cut because actually they've been told they were going to get 20%. So the 17% increase is not actually that. But the Bureau of Twitter will be hiring more people, and the Bureau of Twitter is not held to account by anybody, really, to produce any standards or metrics or what they've done. And then the Washington Post, at that point, makes an interesting story pointing out that actually Twitter went out of business three years ago. <laughs> no, I'm not interested in regulating Twitter. <laughs> Okay, well, um, since you managed somehow, and I'm not sure how you did it, but you, man you managed to reference uh, woolly mammoths, Baskin Robbins, and the Amish in w one talk, I'm going to go ahead and double up on a couple of these and see if you can handle this. Okay, so we've got. Did I mention Baskin Robbins? Yeah. When did I roll the tape? I think it was exactly at the 31 mark. Yeah. <laughs> Mint Sorry. chocolate chip. Okay, so um, th there's word that I want to mention two names. Michael Av Av Avenatti, we just got, word just got in that he was arrested, and they want to know if you have any comment. And then, are they really revitalizing Al Franken? So can you put those two guys together? <laughs> you hate me. You really hate me. <laughs> Avenatti, I don't have anything to say about that, guys. Um, one day, though, however, uh, I read a tweet of his, 
no surprise, I can't remember what it was. And I went to look at his account. You know, if you tap on somebody's avatar on Twitter, you can go to their account and you can see details, what they say about themselves, their pronouns, um, where they live. And there was a very interesting phrase that I saw on Michael Avenatti's uh, Twitter page. It was, follows you. <laughs> and I walked around the office, showing people in. Michael Avenatti follows me. Michael Avenatti follows me. Don't like him, but it must be coming up in the world. This caused everybody else in the office to take a look at the Michael Avenatti thing, and everybody in the office was followed by Michael Avenatti. He is the only human being on earth who follows every single person in the world on Twitter. <laughs> so it means absolutely nothing. When it comes to the rehabilitation of Al Franken, uh, it, it was amusing because a lot of people said, oh, you know what, that wasn't fair. That wasn't fair. Uh, he got caught up in the whole Me Too thing. You know, that picture of him grabbing, they weren't actually touching anything. If they'd been touching something, if you'd been grabbing her while she was asleep, yeah, I can see why he should have resigned. But his hands were two and a half inches away, so maybe he should have been censured. This is an argument we actually had. Uh, but he had to go, and there was actually no love lost among many quarters for it because he was not generally loved as an individual, shall we say. But people regarded him as a useful senator, and therefore uh, lamented his voice in the Senate, etc., etc., etc. There will be rehabilitation of him. They're trying to do the same sort of to bring Garrison Keillor back, and the appetite among Minnesotans for both seems to be remarkably scant. <laughs> Would you say the same is true for Jesse Ventura? Oh, yes. Okay. Would you say the, the, to that? Yeah, well, the, I mean, everybody loved Jesse at the, first, at, the, at the first, and it was great. Jesse was, I mean, Jesse was a force of nature. He was unique. And Jesse would come up with things like, yeah, I believe in light rail. Light rail's great, because if you go to a game and you drink a lot, you can go home on the light rail and you won't get a DUI. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. And Jesse would come out and, you know, he wouldn't come out with any big policy prescriptions. What he said was basically they take too much of your money and they don't do anything smart with your money. It's not good they take your money. But I will give you legal fireworks and it won't cost so much for your license tabs. <laughs> and people were surprised that he won. Uh, but then he got real churlish and he had no party to work for. And then he kind of went blah, 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 and moved to Mexico and started putting rubber bands in his beard. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Okay, so uh, I want to leave you with an opportunity. The audience is interested in hearing a little bit about Ricochet, so I'm going to let you go out of here with uh, uh, sharing oh, a little bit about what you're doing. Right, go out with a sales pitch. People yeah. love that when an extended yeah. sales pitch for their <laughs> money is what. Well, you're doing. fun to listen to. Uh, it's basically this. Everybody, anybody heard of Ricochet? I know we got some members here tonight. Raise your hand. Gosh, bless you. Great. Ricochet is the place on the internet that you want to go, that you dreamed of existing, and it actually does. Why? When you go to YouTube, when you go to any site that has comments, you know that immediately it becomes a scrum match between the stupidest gnomes and trolls you've ever met in your life. And that every stupid remark you've ever had and every dumb argument is rehashed endlessly by people who cannot spell. Ricochet is completely different because, get this, you gotta pay. And because people subscribe, they have what founder Rob Long calls skin in the game, which means we're all invested in Ricochet to work. There's a code of conduct. Can't call people that. You gotta be nice, you gotta be civil, you gotta stay on point. It's not enforced with a ban hammer or a jack boot. It just means that we all get along by a set of agreed rules. So you join Ricochet and you get access to this incredible podcast feed that's got everybody you wanna listen to, <clears throat> including your host here tonight. And uh, James Dellingpole from England, you got Rob Long, you got Jonah Goldberg, you got the people you love, the people you hate, and you get access to the member feed. It's really cheap. And the member feed is everything from politics to arts to culture to music to history to science. It's all of us getting together all 24-7 and just talking about things. And it's a community online the likes of which I've never seen. Ricochet.com. Tell them I sent you. Hey, I don't care who sent you. Just, just, just sign up. If we could get a few of you to sign up tonight, when you go home and take a look, that'd be great. And let me say to stop... I owe Erica so much for this that I, I really, she's been great, she brought me here twice, that I, even if you asked me back, I'm sorry, I wouldn't, but if you wanted to add $500 to it, I'd be, you know. <laughs> Erica, he's strong on me already. Erica who? <laughs> you are absolutely wonderful. You're, you're doing the hard work in a, in a cold place. And thank you so much for showing up. And keep believing, keep trying, keep saying yes. And maybe I'll see you in a couple of years. It's been great fun for James, you. thank you so very much. You are absolutely delightful. <laughs> what a terrific way to kick off 2020 at the Silicon Valley Forum. Liberty Forum. <laughs>